I have an opportunity that uh, I might say a lot of people would almost die for to have a family this big and with no real conflicts within the family. And again, I can't, I can't get away from this chest thing. I, <laughs> that's one of the main reasons I want to, I hate to say it, the main reason I want to get out of prison is I want to play chess in the chess tournaments again. I played before. And I, I, in, in here in prison, I can win nine out of ten games. I don't care who I play with. It's it, it really, I'm, I still have my rating. I get my magazine, my ratings on a magazine, et cetera. <laughs> That's just takes my breath away. <laughs> 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 well, there's a whole, whole world full of chess players out there. Oh, yeah. I shot the sheriff. In the late 1990s, I joined a small group of activists organized around raising awareness about the prison industrial complex in America. We were also committed to raising money for Mark Cook for when he was released from prison. Mark had been in prison for nearly 24 years when I showed up one day at the state prison in Monroe, Washington to meet him for the first time. As I neared finishing the interviews for this project, I showed Mark this flash mob video that my sister had found on the internet. He said, I want that to be at the beginning. I try and feel 80, but it's hard. You know, I feel much, I'm not saying young, you know, young, but much younger. I don't feel like I'm 80 because I see a lot of these people around here in their 70s and decrepit. Even in the 60s, they're just decrepit. The only life I really know is prison life. And that's a, a hard thing to say. Everything is judged by that. Most people are judged according to how I judge people in there, you see. I became really aware of my abilities in prison, and it's mostly because other prisoners were coming to me. They see me reading books or uh, 
doing my homework, high school homework, and later on my college work, and they saw something that I, I didn't realize. I was just doing my work, you know, and uh, kind of appointed me as a, a, a leader. You know, I helped form the, the first black uh, uh, group inside of Walla Walla, a legitimate black group, the Black Prisoners Forum Unlimited. I, I did the Panthers, Black Panthers, in Walla Walla. How many years out of 80 were you in? I'm forgetting. Approximately. <coughs> uh, 40 years altogether. I counted them out. Look at them. my chronological stuff. In 1976, Mark was convicted of assaulting an officer while aiding a prisoner's escape and state and federal bank robbery charges. He was sentenced to two life terms and 10 years on each conviction. In 1997, Mark was interviewed by staff of the King County Public Defender Association, part of an effort to get him paroled. Mark was paroled in 2000 after serving 24 years in custody. I used to follow my big brothers all the time, me and my, my cousin. So when we lived in the country in Bellevue, we used to follow them through the woods and see you know, what they was doing. And one day they jumped on me and put a gunny sack over my head, tied me to some bean poles and laid me on the railroad tracks. The train was coming and I was hollering and screaming. And I knew it was going to get run over, but it was on a, a spur and the train just went right on by. And they said, you'll never follow us again. And it's right. <laughs> but, but anyways, you know, it, there was, there was a closeness. Uh, Whenever I get out, I always go see them, and I'm just I'm really, really anxious to not only see them, but, you know, know what's happening. I have a, a brother who had a serious mental problem when he was in the, in the military. He came out, he never recovered from it, and I, I want to see him. Uh, he's my younger brother, and the youngest in the family. Uh, is, I know it doesn't mean much to anybody else, but I sure want to... In 2020, we started visiting on Zoom on lockdown in the pandemic. He told me about his childhood in Seattle and he let me record him. Six. So my, my father died in 42, then that makes me six years old at that time. All right. That's my mother and us eight children. At the very bottom, that's my younger brother. And like I say, she was pregnant when he, he died. And you have to remember, my mother's family uh, were first generation out of slavery. We're, we're get a, gonna get a copy of, this is a very poor copy. My sister sent it to me while I was in prison. Being, I, was, I was gonna be in prison the rest of my life. She was sending me stuff, right? All we get is just look, these little notes of them. So they were from Callaway, it says, which Callaway was a slave area in, in Missouri. Slaves just gathered up whoever they had and split. <laughs> I believe that's what happened. They all left. They wanted to get as far away from all that slavery and stuff as they could. So they came up here to the Northwest to uh, uh, the Oregon Territory. 
which later became Oregon and Washington. Slaves were not, ex-slaves were not allowed to live in Oregon. They were allowed to live in, in the Washington area. So that's why they ended up there and a lot of my relatives. But looking back on it, I know she must have been terrified when she was pregnant and left with us seven kids and never lost one of us, kept us all together, no matter what. When we got to, uh, what do you call it, 23rd and Jefferson, I went to school at Horse Man. During one of our lessons, uh, they had us read out of a book and I was reading out of the book, doing pretty good until, I don't know if, if I ran across a word I didn't understand, but I was autistic. Uh, but anyways, she started shaking me and I started crying. So she turned me over her knee and started spanking me and I bit her and I got kicked out of school. That was that horse man. So that's the first school I got, ever got kicked out of. <laughs> Racism is, was taught, actually taught in school or got children familiarized with how they were to their place with each other. And so they read the books, you know, like uh, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin or uh, uh, Tom Sawyer and the Black Jim, who was a slave there. A lot of stories, it was funny to the white kids, but it wasn't funny to us. We didn't understand what was, what was going on with that because we didn't really know what slavery was. We was just starting to learn in, in school what slavery was. And it was all, as far as the books were concerned, these are all happy people who were brought up from Africa, who worked on the farm, the la, la, la. It's okay. So, but they, they weren't allowed to live, live together. They talked the same way about the Indians. Okay. And then they had these other books, so-called children books. You've heard of them, Little Black Sambo, E. Pandamandis, and those type of books. And they read them. And to the other kids, the white kids, it was, it was kind of funny, you know. And when we get on the school ground, they'd, you know, call, call me Sambo and stuff like that. And so we told my mother, so my mother went to the grade school. This is a, a Concord grade school in South Park and talked to the principal. And he, because he's Italian, he, he came from a family of immigrants over here. And he says, he says, I know, I know what you're talking about. He says, because, you know, he, he kind of said, you know, the same thing happens to us and our children. So if anything like that happens in school and they, they're offended, they have my right to lead the class and the, te uh, the teachers will know this and go home or whatever. They don't have to stay and listen to that crap. Uh, but the, you know, in those days, certain books were required in school. There wasn't, the principal couldn't say, I'll take these books and not those books. And a lot of them tried stuff like that. They just went, went along with the crowd and we lived in our separate places. Uh, and it was a, what's called it? A hard struggle. It was a continuing struggle for all of us, whether you were Native American or, or, or Black. I mean, there was, in those days, there were no Native Americans, there were Indians, that's what they called them, you know. In 1950, the war ended and they started tearing all those places down, taking them. They had uh, bunkers. These were bunkers with soldiers in them. They had the, uh, in, in South Park, they had a camp cook. That was, we didn't run it. That's where they kept the German prisoners of war. And there was a lot of segregation and a lot of the, Blacks got real dirt jobs. And one of the dirt jobs was to take care of the German prisoners of war. And they let the German prisoners of war go in downtown Seattle to the movies and, you know, places like that. But the black soldiers weren't allowed to go down there. American soldiers. I, that's how bad it was, you know. It, it, all of that lasted even up into the, the 50s and 60s. Uh, it was kind of a redlining, part of the redlining. At Queen Anne High School, at age 17, Mark asked a cafeteria worker to give him folding money in exchange for his change. The cafeteria supervisor said, no, you don't give any change or do anything for those. Mark broke a glass trophy case at the school and was sent away to a state mental hospital, eventually labeled a psychopathic delinquent.
should be bitter about something, but I am not. I, I seriously, you know, you can't say I, I haven't thought about just <coughs> hanging it up in here. In fact, uh, there's a group of prisoners not only here, mostly in the federal system, they say they sleep with a bag under the bed. When the time to go, they just put the plastic bag over there and go. Uh, and I always got a plastic bag too. <laughs> uh, but I've, I've never seen a position where that's going to happen. It's just, that's, that's one of those kind of uh, attitudes that I don't like. It's kind of a hard case attitude. Is that you can only uh, punish me so long that I'll, I'll take no more punishment. When I was 18 years old, I was in a mental hospital in uh, Medical Lake, that's Eastern Washington by Spokane, and I was tortured. And I, n I would never in my life believe then that I, you know, person be tortured like that. And when I was, to uh, after I was tortured, I believed anything can happen in an uh, institution, a, a state institution, especially in a hospital, it never should have happened. But it wasn't something that's accidental or something that I just might think is torture. It was deliberate. I was stripped, put in a, a straight jacket, uh, had my cuffs, feet cuffed to the bottom of a bed, had a sheet run under my arms on each side behind my neck, tied to each bedpost and stretched till I raised up off the bed and then beat in the stomach. These are by medical people. And the reason they, they claimed they were doing it is because they had information from another prisoner that I was going to try and escape. There was no, no escape plan at all. <coughs> they just took the word of another, and this was a mental patient, a real mental patient. I was considered what's called a psychopath delinquent, which does not exist. There was, in those days, they don't even use the term anymore. They don't even lock people up that way no more. This was an indefinite commitment because they believed that I was so uh, delinquent as a child that I should never be released. And I was placed on a criminally insane ward at the age of uh, about 17. This is uh, an experience that I've had in my say, 35 years of being in institutions that I, I can never forget. I can't cooperate too much with people in power, mainly because of that one experience. Uh, you know, I'll, never, I'll never forget it. It didn't happen to me. It happened to many people before and after me. The same experience. And there was nobody who has never to my knowledge, been taken to court, so things like that, and worse were going on. I was just lucky. I was young, and I, I was strong. I could, I, in a sense, I could handle that. It's kind of like the thing I was telling you: that black people are used to being lynched, so <laughs> I could handle that. I had to make my own rules. I couldn't go by rules made by either the institution, or made by the police outside, or made by anybody other than myself. I learned that in prison. I had to <clears throat> make my own rules. Yeah. Where'd you learn it? You said. Um. Why do you think you're that way? <laughs> <coughs> it first became evident when I was tortured in the, the, the mental hospital. When I went to the doctor, he says, well, why are you telling me this? And I said, well, we, we've got our rights. He says, you have no rights. You're crazy. And that's when I figured out I got it. Not making my own. I can't go by what other people are saying. So I do everything I can, behavior-wise, to, in a sense, to maintain my own integrity, that I can respect myself. And if I can respect myself, anybody can. Uh, but I don't look for anything in return. I can't be bitter if nobody recognizes that, hey, this guy hasn't done anything for, I mean, had an infraction for 21 years, only had one infraction for 21 years. I don't expect anything from anybody because of this. But I feel a lot of really good about myself. But I cannot say, I mean, yeah, you keep me in here, say, till the, till the rest of my life, I'll never really be able to respect those people who run the criminal justice system because of what I've seen, what I've experienced.
done a lot of foolish things hey, yeah. in, the, in the mental hospital I ran across this guy who came out of Walla Walla and Casey's the one that told me about he was a uh, part Indian he said you know we're black and Indian and we're poor I mean that's the way we were raised and that's the life we know he said but we gotta make rules for ourselves never be too lazy to work or too scared to steal and he said that's the way we live if you're gonna be a thief that's what you gotta live by that's making your own rules and he says what I'm telling you is what I, I do he said you do what you have to do but you have to understand that nobody's going to help you, and that's a hard thing. I was uh, probably 19 or 20 when he told me this, and that's a hard thing for a youngster to learn and understand. And I learned it when I was in the, the, the torture part of the hospital, but I also carried with me everywhere. When he think, started thinking like a thief, the first two robberies I did, I was thinking, you know, like uh, Casey told me. Never be too lazy to work and too scared to steal. I couldn't find a job. I tried and tried. I tried to go into the Air Force, etc. Nobody would take me. So I became a thief. My prisoners said uh, all the black prisoners have to eat on, in that mess hall. They can't eat in this mess hall. And Jones stood up on the table with a shank and he says, we're going to eat wherever we want. And if you don't like it, bring it, bring it on. Nobody brought it on. They locked them up for five years. But that's what happened. It, it broke the, uh, the, the race ban on the mess halls. There's still a lot of uh, racism within the prison, uh, sanctioned by the, the staff, of course. A lot of jobs you couldn't get into because of, of race. In the laundry, I worked on a, on a back pre on presses and stuff. That's where it's really hot, you know, flathead presses and stuff back there. The white prisoners worked up front uh, on the dryers and washing machines and stuff like that. So I went to a, uh, the boss and told him, hey, you got, you got to give us a break to learn how to use some of this machinery so when we get out, we can go to the laundry and use the machinery. And he says, you don't tell me what to do. Okay, this happened during uh, lunchtime when everybody had gone out. And we're standing next to a, a big extractor. The extractor is about, about as round as this, the diameter of this room. And he says, you don't tell us what to do. You, d you do what we tell you. And I pushed him. He fell into that extractor. I hit this button and the lid came down. And I, I, I dogged it shut and pressed it. But then started going down. I started to walk out and go to the mess hall. I told him, no, no, no. I came back and shut it, shut it off, popped the lid up, and he's getting up and going around. So I got locked up in the hole for that. How long? But, huh? How long? Um, That's kind of serious. Like today, that th this is weird. This is this is near the not even near the end of my sentence. About two thirds of my sentence. Uh, they were going to call me to the for the pro board, and I refused to go. I said, no, I know what's waiting for me in there. I'm not going to the pro board. And they sent the goon, goon squad in and they dragged me out. I had these old ragged, you know, prison uh, solitary confinement clothes on, you know, wrinkled up and torn. And they took me for the pro board and I just sat in that chair. And they kept asking me, why did you attack the, the uh, uh, laundry boss? I wouldn't say nothing. And there's one guy, he's a, he's a uh, black guy on, on the board. He said, you know, I won't just go with your mother, Mrs. Cook, Minerva. So he, he's trying to get get through to me. So 
he says, I know how the world is. We know how the world is. If you've got to have something to say, say it now. The warden was sitting there too. And so I told him. I told him how they're treating black prisoners, you know, workers in there. And I said, it just isn't right. I went back to my cell and they sent a slip in and she would be paroled in six months. <laughs> they have this habit of getting rid of me when I, I start something. The story of Walla Walla had, had a lot to do with the underground newspaper. That is something that never happened in a prison before. It was a, a newspaper run by prisoners and the administration had no control, didn't even know how it was being made and, and dis distributed. But it was very influential, it brought all the prisoners together. It was, in a sense, the first really contract between races in prison to come together and do one thing, and uh, a single thing. And we called the underground newspaper the bomb. There was only six of us doing it. A homemade printing press. It was a mirror with a little wooden barriers around it, taped on with masking tape so we could pour liquid gelatin into the mirror and it would settle. And when it would cool, we'd take, uh, they had this old mimeograph paper where you could type on one side and print would come out on the other side. Well, on the white sheet where it would come out on, we could lay this down on this gelatin, hold it down for a few seconds and peel it off. The gelatin would absorb the ink right into it. And then we'd take plain typing paper, lay it on there, and spread it down and peel it off. And that was our printing press. Really only two sheets of paper folded, looked like four sheets. The articles were, were really short and brief. We told about how the uh, warden and some of the staff were stealing things from the prisoners. Like Red Cross would come down and do the, a blood draw and did a little undercover stuff. I found out they were getting $10 a pint, but only giving the prisoners $5 a pint. The other uh, $5 went to the warden. But we all had our issues. There was a selling, seg segregated selling at that time. It's segregated now, but back then, we decided we was going to break it up because with that, like I say, with the underground newspaper and the bomb, we were able to bring everybody together on the same page. And it was kind of like the Vietnam struggle outside. Everybody was together because everybody's against the Vietnam, so they stuck together no matter, you know, what their race issues were. Well, we started about 1969, earnestly. That's when we started. The, the administration started saying, all right, let them try this, and if it fails, we're going to take the prison back over from them, and which they did eventually. I was gone when it happened. In fact, I think I was kicked out because they knew I was instrumental in, in starting this. Wait, you think they let you out because you were... <laughs> yeah, because they kept using me for a spokesperson. When the prison was locked down in the strike, they called me out to meet with the warden to with another group of prisoners to say what our, our grievances were, etc. Okay, and when they decided, okay, you guys have to write a constitution, in a sense, we were appointed to write the constitution. When they wanted to do a, a experimental uh, tier, where we could take 16 prisoners, put them on that tier, and not lock them up. The doors were open all the time. And have a little social gathering space where <laughs> we wrote to the Playboy magazine and they sent us these blow-up chairs, you know. So <laughs> we had these blow-up chairs and everything. And we were able to invite uh, people from downtown and from the colleges, et cetera, to come in. And a lot of time, the upper echelon of the staff would come in and visit with us. We got them to let us have our own uh, industry. So they gave us a space in prison industries to do upholstery. So we had this reupholstery factory within the prison industries. And of course they'd get uh, furniture from the state and even from the various prisons. We had to patch them up, you know, make them like new and send them back. And it was the only business in prison industries that was making a profit. <laughs> Everything else was losing. We started getting this literature about the Black Panther Party and about other struggles that were happening outside. And Clement said, you know, we got to start a Panther Party. I said, okay, well, we got to get permission. You know, you don't start something like that. So we wrote to the Panthers in Oakland, and they said, yeah, 
you, you could start a chapter up there. But you have to report to us every week. Uh, you have to tell us who was assigned as officers, et cetera. So we did that. What year was that? Because yeah. I thought we were in 72 during the Walla Walla stuff. This is the, that's when we were in jail in 1967. Went Wait, to prison. we went backwards. Huh? Well, so you did the three robberies. I, well, you did the robberies, yeah. And then you got out. I, as a thief, yeah, I'm a thief now. What was the one where you were in Walla Walla and all that? This, I mean, this is in Walla Walla. That's me right here. Right. Okay, this is, and we started a Black Panther party. So, the underground, underground people, Canadians, said, "Come on and help us do this bomb." That's that's at the point when I became political. The Panthers had given me a real political consciousness that we could do something for black people. If the government was going to do it, we could do it. That was the whole thing. We needed, you know, decent housing, medical care. We can do it. If they don't do it for us, we could do it. They had the free clinics, uh, food banks they're setting up, up, and all the other radicals start catching on to this. The Brown Berets formed and the AIM form behind the Panthers had their 10-point programs. Everybody was working together at that time. After the strike, we formed a group called the, the BUF, the Black United Front. It was totally underground. This is all the black prisoners. The reason they locked us down was the black prisoners wanted to see a movie that the white supremacists did not want shown, and that, and that was the 100 Rifles with uh, Jim Brown and Raquel Wells. And we said, if we can't see that movie, we're not going to work, none of the black prisoners are going to work. They said, so what? So we locked down. And everybody else locked down. They, they said, well, man, we're going to stand up. If you don't lock down. Uh, they, so they locked down with us. And then we turned it into this grievance thing for everybody. But the, the main thing, it started off with just the black prisoners. Okay. So when it was over, we formed the BUF, the Black United Front, fashioned out of the, a thing in uh, Chicago that was going on in Chicago. Well, the warden, of course, there's snitches among us. The warden found out, and Buffalo Head, he was... <laughs> That's the name we gave this social I warden. remember that from our <laughs> la 10 years ago when we talked. Okay, Bucklehead called me into his office. He said, we're not going to have none of these racial brotherhoods going on here. I said, no, it's a culture group. We're just trying, we've got a culture group. You know, we're black and we, you know, we have holidays that we celebrate outside. We don't get to celebrate in here. And we want to see movies and blah. And he said, you're bullshitting me, Cook. He said, well, I'll tell you what. You go out in that population. I'm going to let you out that door now. And you go find some Mexicans and Native Americans and some whites who could want a culture group. If you can find them, you've got a chance. But if you can't find them, I'm going to put you in a hole for one year. So I went to Jim Robidoux. Uh, he was a brother of that Robidoux that was over in uh, Wounded Knee. And Pablo Griego, he is a Hispanic. So I go out and I find them and say, yeah, yeah we want to start a, a group in here, you know, the Indians, uh, uh, brothers. And uh, Mexicans said, yeah. And then there was one guy, uh, oh, Big Don Cole. He said, I can start an Irish group. I said, you're not Irish. He says, I don't care. I can start an Irish group in here. And so I said, you guys are still going to stand with me on this now. You're not going to back down. He said, we're not going to back down. None of our brothers are going to stand back down. So I went in and told Buffalo Head, yeah, I got the group. So they said, we'll even do it. So the warden come and he said, well, you're not going to have the uh, no black United Front in here. And I said, okay, and I'll talk to him and we'll get another name. And so what I did, Black Prisoners Forum Unlimited had the BUF in there. <laughs> it was just, just out of spite. We did that acronym. We did the acronym so a lot of times you know, just out of spite. So I was the first uh, president for that organization. It's a role to this day, as you, you know. Just part of the old history. When Mark was released to a halfway house in Seattle, he founded Convention 72, a yearly forum for prisoners, ex-prisoners, prison workers, and political activists. Later, Mark co-founded a nonprofit business in Seattle called Pivot. They hired former prisoners to work in micrographics, security, upholstery and carpeting, and construction. shot the sheriff 
But I didn't shoot no deputy I shot the sheriff But I didn't shoot no deputy When I got out of prison, there was very few Panthers. I went to the Panther headquarters, and they were just pretty much doing the clinic thing up there then. When a uh, brigade came along and said they were doing this type of work they were doing, and they needed help, it looked like I was the only one in the whole group that had any money. I mean, because I lived so sparsely in prison. I could live you know, a whole month on $5, you know, just uh, I spend a, a dollar a week or two dollars a week. I had it all written down exactly what I had to do with it. That when I got out and got a check, I cash one check, but I, the checks I got after that, I just threw them in a drawer until they came and told me I had to cash my checks. This mess kept their books. So I just started cashing a check. I got a bank account, and I just put money in there. And when they needed money, I'd give them money. I remember talking to uh, Ed and John Sherman and Bruce Seidel, and it was me and Bo. We sat there and talked. And they told me about armed propaganda. He said, it, it, we don't attack people in any way, he said, that we attack their property. People were more concerned about their property than they were about their employees. They'd do the communique, they'd do a, an armed action, and then issue this communique. At that time, they had it down where they could get it to a newspaper or the radios, and they'd publish the whole thing, you know, at that time. And it was working. prison thing. They got people out of the hole. They got some things changed. They got the warden and other officers fired from the prison to do an action. Uh, that was a bombing up in Olympia. They blew up the Department of Corrections office, right, in Olympia. When they weren't paying the women uh, equal wages to the men in city light or letting them have the jobs, we did a bombing there because they, they had transfer to the blow up ship and they got Got, got their, what they're looking for. FBI offices and the BIA offices, they knew what that was about. It was in support of what was happening in Wounded Knee and out of Pine Ridge. Uh, but there were positive results from every one of those bombings that I can recall. But when they're doing that, when they told me what they're doing before I got involved with them, it made sense. Edway putting it, he got tired of walking around and circled with a picket sign every time he wanted to demonstrate. He said, we want some real action. Why don't they fill it in their pocket book when we do something? But that was a brigade, and I said, well, you know, they're using the name of George Jackson Brigade. George was pretty much a Maoist, but he was anti-capitalist. And in his name, I think they did a really good job for being a mixed group. It was a wonderfully mixed group, you know, being gay and lesbian and white and black and you know. Then I picked up the Native Americans and some other people that came with me. Good people always have been. They just were caught up in uh, something that happened in the 60s and 70s as a, something unique uh, to political struggle or social uh, conflict in, in America. It's a, time I, I lived through, and it's not just one of the things on the sidelines, a lot of us have lived through it, and it's, it's here and gone. Can you say something in 307 about whether or not you have any feelings about you being the last code to get out? It's something that we all understand mutually, that I would be the last one out just because I'm black. I mean, it, no matter how the sentence were set up, there's no question in, in any of our minds that I would be the last one to get out. It's just, just be unheard of, in other words. Uh, Do you feel bitter about it? The, the thing is, no, you know, I don't feel bitter about it because I understand it. It's, it's almost like, you know, it's black people being used to being lynched. Like you can't, you, you know, it's just going to happen. Eventually, the brigade began robbing banks to fund its activities. A brigade member was captured in the course of a robbery in 1976. In an effort to free his comrade, Mark shot a police officer in the stomach.
Mark later wrote him a letter of explanation and apology. Mark spent 24 years in prison for his actions with the George Jackson Brigade. Ed, Mark, Bo, and Janine remained lifelong friends. Bo Brown passed away on October 25, 2021, a day after Mark visited her in Oakland, where he was attending a Black Panther reunion. But when I'm uh, a part of the, uh, the social organism or a private organism, I'm, I'm a worker, I'm a laborer. Uh, they want more out of me than they're going to give me in return. And so there's always this conflict or you know, it's going to be this, this struggle between us. When I was in Wall Wall in about 1968, I became a Panther and I was taken to it because the main philosophy, one of the main philosophies was dealing with workers. They were, we were given them what we call a red book by, uh, written by Mao and it was a communist philosophy. But it stressed that the workers and the peasants own the world, etc. But I was drawn to it because there was nothing else that attracted me. The, in a sense, uh, democratic republican uh, party system, and I say party system because it's not a philosophy, it's a system, and you reject it, pretty much reject workers. I'm, I'm reading history, uh, and that's about all I really have to do that's worthwhile in prison to develop myself is read because there's nobody really here to teach. But the Panthers were able to come and teach me. They taught me a very extreme, uh, you know, a brand of politics. But it was valuable to me. Prison has to have kind of a, a communist ideology to start, start off with. Poor people do. In a, they have a, a closer uh, connection to socialism and, and communism than wealthy people do. Because wealthy people say, I'm out for myself. This is running good. Like, uh, Trump said, I don't care if I go bankrupt, I can get some more money someplace else. I don't care about them people losing their jobs. Poor people don't think that way. They try and think about the person working with them. Some people have empathy built into them, you know. Uh, and empathy and sympathy. Other people, they don't care. When I was in, in Leavenworth, I started getting numb in there, the violence in there. I killed somebody in, in a mess hall. And, I just wondered, could I get that tray if he's, if he's not going to use it? Panthers changed me. I saw on TV when I was in jail when they were on the steps in Sacramento with the guns. And then I heard about their program. They said it made a lot of sense, you know. Uh, I wasn't really into the guns that much. I was into the program. That's, it sounded cool. It, and when we talked about it in prison, me and my buddy Clement Blanche <laughs> we decided to start the Panthers. We started it and tried to apply that the same 10 points in prison that were being applied outside. We're given this economy, all, all the advantages, all the inventions, all the labor it needs to, to thrive and, and get larger, and we're not getting any of the fruits of it. Right, none. Yeah, e even those who can't work, you know, and it comes partly down to the Marxist theory that every, everybody should have their needs met. I, 
I realized from my, the earliest days of my life about racism in America. I didn't really understand it until I was in my 20s. And after under, understanding it, I wasn't able, able to be an activist until I was in my 30s. And that's, that's strange, but uh, some people acted earlier. And it's, when you get involved in a, in, in a movement of any kind, it's, it's not so much a matter of choice. You almost get caught up in it. Martin Luther King got caught up in something that Rosa Parks did. This, this woman would just uh, you know, wanted to sit down. And he had no idea that that woman was wanted to sit down that much for so many years that one day she just had that enough to sit down. He, he, he wasn't thinking about any movement at that time. He just got caught up in it, and a lot of us do. But it's something I'm conscious of all my life, and even to this day, it's never out of my mind. I had a psych psychologist, a prison psychologist, uh, I think it was a psychiatrist, said it's too much on my mind, that race is too much on my mind, and I should never be released from prison. <laughs> That and that's why so many black people are in prison, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's something that you just cannot say it doesn't exist. If there's anything specific about my poli politics, yeah, this is it. That I have done so much time in prison that I cannot separate myself. It will take a long time for me to separate myself from the plight of people who are in prison. And they're, they're, to me, they're not prisoners. It's kind of a, it's a people who are excluded from the uh, economy, the the, uh, the workforce, management. These are, there's seems to be no place for them, us. But I know there is. Inside, Mark tutored other prisoners, teaching many to read. The Federal Bureau of Prisons moved Mark to 16 different prisons, another form of punishment. Mark stayed connected to political prisoners like Leonard Peltier and comrades from the Philippines. After his release in 2000, Mark worked as a paralegal at the Defender Association and was active in its union, SEIU. Mark remains active in labor union work and social, racial, and prisoner struggles. Smooth waters, I go in as a man with many cries comes up again. As my sins flow down the Jordan, oh, I want to come here and give every part of me. But there's blood on my hands, and my lips are unclean. Go.
freedom in the history of our nation. Every day.